Hi, my name is Laura Hooper, and I'm a professor in the Department of Immunology at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center in Dallas, Texas. And I'm also an investigator of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. And my first talk in this series is going to be on mammals and their symbiotic gut microbes. Humans are home to an absolutely staggering number of bacteria. There are anywhere between 10 and 100 trillion bacterial cells that live uh, on various human body surfaces, most prominently in the intestine. And if you compare this number to the number of human cells, um, which is only about a trillion, it turns out that at best we're only about 10% human. And so we're just beginning to learn about what kinds of organisms colonize the human body, what they do, and how they impact our health. So uh, in the past, when, uh, when we've thought about bacteria, we've tended to think about bad bacteria. And this is because there are a lot of bacteria that cause um, terrible disease. And so I've got uh, just three examples on this slide. Um, so one example is uh, Listeria monocytogenes. Um, and uh, this is um, uh, if you eat a, a potato salad that has been out in the sun uh, for quite some time, you might get a listeria infection. So this is a foodborne pathogen. Another example is Salmonella typhi. This is another foodborne pathogen that can cause severe intestinal disease. And then finally, another example is Bacillus anthracis, or anthrax, which can cause severe upper respiratory tract infections that can, in fact, lead to death. So there are certainly some bad characters out there, but what we're learning, what we've been learning in recent years, is that the uh, vast majority of bacteria that are in contact with humans um, are actually uh, normal residents of the human body and, in fact, have um, positive uh, effects on human physiology that I'll be discussing in, in my uh, talk today. So bacteria colonize virtually all human body surfaces. These include the nasal passages, which harbor uh, upwards of 100 million bacteria. The mouth contains uh, about 10 billion bacteria. Another 10 billion bacteria live on the skin. And then the gut uh, contains an absolutely staggering number of bacteria. Um, as I mentioned before, um, it, this can be as many as 100 trillion. So uh, um, some definitions um, that are relevant uh, for uh, uh, understanding what I'm going to talk about today, and especially if you uh, read about this field in the literature, um, are shown on this slide. So uh, one term that you'll see used uh, quite frequently and that I'll use in my talk is uh, the microbiota. And this term is used to refer to uh, the uh, collective uh, microorganisms that colonize normal, healthy individuals. So you'll he hear me refer to the gut microbiota. Another term that's commonly seen uh, not only in uh, the, the scientific literature but also in the popular press is the term microbiome. And this term can actually mean one of two things depending on, on the context, so it's a little confusing. It was originally taken to mean uh, the collective genomes of the organisms in the microbiota, so it was uh, specifically coined to refer uh, to the DNA encoding uh, uh, the genes in the members of the microbiota. But you'll see it used, particularly in the popular press, to refer to the microbiota itself. And so just to avoid confusion, I'll use the term uh, microbiota to refer to uh, the microorganisms that colonize the human body. So there are a number of, of really big and very interesting questions in this field, and I'll be uh, discussing some of the uh, uh, answers to these questions in uh, my, both of my talks, both uh, the first one and the second one. So one very interesting question is which bacterial species colonize humans? So who's in there? And a second uh, very important question is why are they there? What are they doing uh, to impact our physiology? Um, how do they shape our biology? Um, and how do they uh, ultimately impact our health? So I'll be discussing uh, answers to these first three questions in uh, my first lecture. In my second lecture, I'll talk about how we keep these bacteria from making us sick. Um, and I'll, in particular, I'll discuss um, a research from my lab that's uh, aimed at, at answering this question. So before I start to address the, the three big questions that I, I showed you on the last slide, I want to uh, make a broader point, which is that it's not just humans, but many animals have beneficial relationships with bacteria. And I've just shown uh, three, I'm putting three of them on this slide um, just as examples. So these are three well-studied examples. So termites, for example, um, harbor uh, 
um, cellulitic bacteria. These are endosymbionts that live in the termite gut, um, and they help the termite to digest the cellulose in wood. Um, the gypsy moth is another uh, well-studied example uh, of a host, uh, an animal bacterial interaction involving uh, a very uh, simple bacterial community that has some very interesting properties. Um, and one that I want to uh, spend some time focusing on in particular is the Hawaiian bobtail squid. So this is a particularly well-studied exam uh, example of an animal bacterial association um, that I think makes some broader points about how they occur. So the scientific name of uh, this organism is Euprimna scolopus. So this is the Hawaiian bobtail squid. And although um, they, they look pretty menacing here, they're actually, these are actually very small uh, creatures. They're only one to two uh, inches long. And they live in the shallow waters um, off of coast, uh, the coast of Hawaii. Um, so what they do is they hunt at night. And what can happen is that if there's a bright moon and stars out, um, this can cause these organisms to cast shadows. But they're hunters, so this, is, this poses a problem for them because they require stealth in order to capture their prey and to in turn uh, avoid being eaten by, by larger uh, animals. So how do they solve this problem? Well, um, the squid, this squid solves this problem by um, establishing a special relationship with an ocean bacterium called Vibrio fisheri. So what's special about Vibrio fisheri is that it can glow. So it's bioluminescent. And what the squid does is it recruits this organism from the ocean into a specialized uh, organ, which is on the ventral side of the squid's body, so on the bottom. Um, and this is called the, the light organ. Um, so these, or these uh, bacteria are recruited into the light organ, and they live and grow there. Um, and so because they're bioluminescent, what, what uh, happens is that the squid is, uh, ends up being lit from underneath and as a consequence avoids uh, casting a shadow. And what's even more fascinating about this relationship and, and these organisms is that the squid um, actually has uh, photo detectors on its back which can sense exactly how much light is coming in from the moon and stars and it can adjust, sort of like a camera, um, how much light is output from the ventral side of its body. So this is a really um, fascinating anti-predatory device which involves uh, an animal bacterial association. So as I mentioned to you, humans also harbor uh, trillions of symbiotic bacteria, mainly in the intestines, and I'm showing you one example here of um, a particularly prominent uh, symbiotic bacterium in the human gut. This is something that I'll mention again. It's got kind of a, a long name, Bacteroides theta iota omicron, and it's sort of a prototypical gut symbiont. Um, but humans don't have bioluminescence. This is not a bioluminescent bacterium. So what are these bacteria doing uh, in our guts, and how can we figure this out? So one of the important experimental tools in this field that I'll refer to in this talk um, are uh, germ-free animals. So, uh, so one of the ways that we can figure out how uh, microorganisms influence our biology is to look at what happens when uh, we, uh, to animals that, that uh, completely lack a microbiota. And believe it or not, this is possible to do. So we can raise animals um, under germ-free conditions and then uh, look at their biology in various ways. And this shows you uh, the type of setup that's used um, in the case of germ-free mice. So this is a picture of a germ-free isolator from my laboratory. And basically, it's a very simple setup. So you have uh, a germ-free plastic enclosure. And you can see that there's a, a mouse cage here. And so we can breed mice inside this, this sterile enclosure. Um, we filter the air going in. So these are our filter stacks over here. Um, so the air going in is sterilized. And everything going in uh, to the isolator, whether it be food, water, bedding, or whatever, um, can be autoclaved and then docked uh, to this um, double door to port here. So you can think of this kind of like you would think about a space station. You would never have uh, both sides of this port open at the same time because then uh, the inside of the isolator would be exposed to the microbe-filled outer world. So we basically dock things to that port for that reason. And then we have gloves built into the side of this isolator that we can use to um, manipulate the mice and other uh, tools and, and so forth inside. So 
Uh, so germ-free animals are an essential tool for determining the impact um, of the microbiota on uh, animal physiology. And actually, the, the first person to suggest the idea of germ-free animals was the great Louis Pasteur, the father of microbiology. And he wrote a comment uh, in 1885. He kind of tossed it off, um, which I thought was very interesting. Um, he actually proposed an experiment. Um, he stated, if I would have the time, I would undertake such an experiment with the preconceived idea that under these circumstances, life would become impossible. So he proposes to make animals germ-free, but he actually doesn't think it's going to work. So what happened? So 50 years later, so 50 years after Pasteur proposed this experiment, people were actually able to do this. Um, so in the 1940s, groups uh, in both the United States and in Scandinavia um, were able to derive uh, uh, rodents, rats and mice mainly, into germ-free conditions and propagate them through uh, multiple generations. And this is uh, one of the uh, early um, germ-free isolators that was uh, used to do this. Um, and uh, the point I want to make here is that we haven't really, this technology has not evolved much from the 1940s, between the 1940s and 2015. It's essentially the same. It's a fairly low-tech um, undertaking. Um, although very labor intensive. So in the interim, though, germ-free animals have become an essential tool in microbiota research. And so one of the, and, and have actually led to a, a, a number of insights into how um, the microbiota impacts um, mammalian physiology. And one of the earliest insights um, into uh, what uh, the microbiota uh, does to, um, to mammalian animal hosts um, uh, stemmed from the observation that when you derive animals into germ -free, uh, a germ-free setting, um, they require an increased energy intake. So they have to eat more just in order to maintain their body weight when you compare them to uh, uh, normally colonized animals. And actually, the, f the first experiments were done on germ-free rats, but we've uh, subsequently uh, repeated these experiments in mice. So they have to take in about 20% more calories to maintain their body weight. And so this observation suggested that perhaps one of the uh, major uh, reasons that uh, we harbor a microbiota is because they, um, they make calories uh, more available from the diet for host uptake. And uh, it turns out that um, uh, organisms that are members of the microbiota make, uh, of the gut microbiota of mammals make uh, a huge number of uh, polysaccharide uh, degrading enzymes that account for this effect. So these are little molecular scissors that snip up long uh, polysaccharides that are uh, an essential component of plant cell walls. So when you eat uh, plants as part of your diet, so let's say you eat a salad, or I think this is, this is bok choy over here, um, you take in a lot of uh, cell wall polysaccharides that are very complex. So these are made up of many different kinds of individual sugars, and they're linked together in a variety of ways. So you need a lot of uh, different enzymes in order to digest these polysaccharides and extract energy from these, um, uh, these plants. And so your microbiota helps you to do this by, by making um, a huge abundance of these enzymes that can uh, um, attack many of the linkages between um, the sugars in these polysaccharides and liberate them so that you can take them up and extract energy. And if you look at uh, how many uh, carbohydrate degrading enzymes are encoded in the, the Bacteroides uh, genome, so this is again the sort of the prototypical gut commensal that I, I talked about earlier. And by the way, we, we have a nickname because it is a long name. We call it B theta, so I'll refer to it uh, from here on out as B theta. So B theta has in its, uh, encoded in its genome 200, uh, over 250 carbohydrate degrading enzymes. Um, as human beings, we only have 95. So the bacteria make a lot more of these enzymes than we do. And this is despite the fact that our genome size is, is nearly uh, uh, three orders of magnitude larger than that of, of B theta. So a lot more of the B theta genome is devoted to the process of uh, carbohydrate degradation from uh, of, of dietary poly polysaccharides. So you've got a lot of metabolic firepower um, in your gut because of uh, the, the bacteria in the microbiota.
And so what we've done essentially over millions of years of, of evolution is we've, uh, we've acquired these bacteria, presumably from the environment. Um, and in doing so, we've uh, essentially acquired a, a rapidly evolving and adaptable external genome. And what this does is that it allows us to maximize energy extraction from the diet. As I said, these uh, organisms help us to liberate um, uh, sugars from uh, dietary uh, polysaccharides that are taken in, usually in, in the form of plant-based polysaccharides. In addition to this benefit, these organisms uh, also allow us uh, to flexibly adapt to dietary changes. So if you start out eating bok choy and you switch to a banana, um, these organisms um, will help you to do that and to flexibly adapt to these changes. So you can imagine that these would be important benefits, especially for our ancestors who um, were living in much more calorically challenging times than we are now. Um, and so the thought is that these were uh, the, the types of driving forces that, it, that uh, drove um, these host bacterial associations that we now benefit from. So what organisms live in the human intestine um, that, uh, that confer these metabolic benefits? Um, so this has been a, a question uh, that's been um, around for a long time, and it turns out that it's not so easy to answer. So initially, um, uh, over the past um, uh, 50 years or so, people, have, uh, people tried to identify the, the members of the human microbiota um, using culture-dependent methods. So essentially, um, what people would do would be to take, for example, a human fecal sample um, and try to culture the bacteria in that sample. So they would grow them on plates or uh, in liquid medium. And then uh, of the bacteria that grew out uh, from this effort, they could uh, be identified either through uh, looking at phenotypic characteristics um, or, or sequencing their DNA um, when, when those techniques became available. The problem with this approach is that uh, most of the bacteria in the human gut and in mammalian guts in general um, are not amenable to culture. They're very fastidious in terms of what nutrients they require. Many of them can't grow in the presence of oxygen. So uh, if you grow bacteria in culture and try to get a picture of what's in the human gut, you're going to get a very biased picture. So fortunately, uh, in the mid-1990s uh, and the early 2000s, um, uh, some, some new techniques came on the scene that allowed um, for culture-independent identification of bacteria. So in these techniques, you uh, take, a, again, a fecal sample, for example, from a, a, a human fecal sample that contains bacteria. You break open uh, the, the bacterial cells, um, extract the DNA, and then sequence um, the, the total community DNA using uh, high-throughput sequencing methods that are now available. And this allows you to identify bacterial groups or species either by comparison to known sequences or sometimes, uh, actually quite frequently, this results in the identification of uh, novel bacterial species that we've never seen before. So with culture uh, independent identification methods in hand, um, there's been an explosion of information about the inhabitants of the human gut over uh, the past decade or so, starting in the mid-2000s. And what these efforts have revealed is that uh, these communities are very complex. So they vary quite a bit between individuals and can change uh, also depending on uh, the health of the person or what they're eating or other environmental uh, influences. Um, this is also a, an extremely uh, complex uh, bacterial community. There are hundreds to thousands of different bacterial species. Um, but some themes, general themes have emerged from these efforts. And one of the, the major themes is that there are really predominantly two bacterial uh, phyla in the human intestine, in, in most uh, mammalian intestines, in fact. Um, so one large group of bacteria that are highly represented in the human gut are the Bacteroidetes. And I've already told you about one uh, member of this phylum. It's Bacteroides theta iota omicron. Um, so there are lots of Bacteroides species in the gut, not just B theta, um, but, but many others. And they all, um, again, really pack this metabolic firepower in terms of being able to um, make uh, polysaccharide degrading enzymes that help extract energy from the diet. Another large group of bacteria which is highly re uh, represented in the human intestine are the firmicutes. 
So these include uh, a lot of different genera, um, but one of the most prominent are the Clostridia. Um, so there are many Clostridium species that normally colonize the human intestine. You may be familiar with some Clostridial bacteria uh, um, because there are, are some which are quite pathogenic. Um, one in particular is Clostridium difficile, which can be an, an enormous problem for people who have been treated with antibiotics um, prior to surgery, for example, and then um, they can get outgrowth of, of Clostridium difficile, which causes um, severe gastrointestinal problems. And I'll talk a little bit more about um, a, a, a microbiota-based uh, method uh, for, um, for fighting these infections in a minute. So these are the two uh, large groups of bacteria that predominate in the human gut. But many, there are many other species that are present at a, lo a much lower abundance. So again, this is a very complex community um, numbering in the 100 to uh, anywhere between 100 and 1,000 different species. So for example, uh, a much uh, lower abundance species that's nevertheless present is one that you might have heard of, Escherichia coli or E. coli. So this is an example of a bacterial species in the human intestine, which is quite easy to culture. As a consequence, it's been harnessed as a, a workhorse for molecular biology. So many people uh, are familiar with it and, and equate it with a, a typical fecal uh, um, bacterium. Um, but it's actually not the most abundant species in the human intestine. Another one which is quite interesting and which will lead to a broader point is a member of uh, the kingdom of Archaebacteria. So these are microorganisms uh, that um, are part of a completely uh, different kingdom of life. So an example of an Archaebacterium in the gut is Methanobrevibacter smithii. And so you may know that uh, many um, uh, Archaebacteria are typically associated with uh, extreme environments such as thermal vents. Um, so here we have one. Um, actually uh, living in the human gut, which leads to the broader point that the human microbiota actually includes uh, representatives of each domain of life. So not only do you have bacteria, members of, of the kingdom of bacteria, such as Bacteroides theta iota omicron, uh, but you have uh, archaebacteria, archae such as Methanobrevibacter smithii, um, and there are also eukaryotic microbes uh, many of which are, are uh, fungal microorganisms, and an example of this is Candida albicans. And I'm not going to talk about these um, uh, in my talk, but these are, are another important component of the human microbiota. So um, there are, uh, at this point, uh, many fascinating questions that we now have the tools uh, to begin to answer in this field. Um, one of these questions is how do uh, gut bacterial communities change during disease? And there are many labs engaged in the effort to identify uh, what happens to gut bacterial communities or other communities on other body surfaces um, during disease. Um, an important question is can uh, changes in community composition cause disease? So is there a cause and effect relationship here? And again, many people are engaged in the effort to answer this question. Finally, can we restore microbial community composition in order to cure disease? And so this is uh, the focus of a lot of um, uh, really interesting efforts, and I thought I would um, give you an example of one of these efforts because uh, you may have read about it in the, um, uh, in the, uh, in the newspaper even. So this is a process called fecal, fecal microbiota uh, transplantation. So you'll recall that I mentioned that if you, uh, in patients that have been treated with um, antibiotics, broad-spectrum antibiotics prior to surgery, for example, the microbiota density and complexity is reduced, and you can have a lot of problems that, that uh, stem from this treatment, um, one of which is the outgrowth of Clostridium difficile. And uh, C. difficile in particular can lead to severe inflammation in the intestine and um, can actually uh, cause um, severe damage to the intestine that's difficult to recover from. So, uh, and, and patients that are, are uh, not, who, um, where antibiotics have not been effective in treating these infections um, have some severe problems. So in recent years, uh, what some doctors have begun to do is to take a fecal sample from a, a healthy human donor. So this is somebody usually that lives with the patient or is related to the patient. Um, they mix this fecal sample with a with saline solution. They filter it, um, and then this uh, 
um, uh, this mixture gets administered to the afflicted patient by endoscopy. And in many cases, what happens is the, the diversity of the microbiota is restored, and this leads to uh, resolution of the symptoms. And this is usually done in patients where um, antibiotic treatment has not been effective. So although we don't fully understand what's going on here in terms of uh, what kinds of organisms are reestablishing themselves and which components of uh, the donor sample are important, um, I think this is uh, an exciting example of how um, how the, the microbiota can be used to, um, to uh, ameliorate a disease. So, um, so we harbor a, a, a complex community of microorganisms in our intestine that are important for uh, our metabolic function. But this is a co-evolved relationship. This has been co-evolving over uh, millions of years of evolution. And so in addition to these metabolic functions, um, the microbiota can impact many different aspects of our physiology. And one, in, one thing in particular that uh, the microbiota uh, does is it impacts our ability to fight infection. And this can happen in several different ways that uh, I'll talk about in the next few slides. Um, so for example, the microbiota uh, impacts our ability to fight infection by inhibiting colonization by pathogens. So this is a phenomenon known as colonization resistance. Um, our microbiota can also induce cross-protective immunity, and I'll give you an example of this in a minute. Um, and finally, uh, gut microorganisms uh, are very important for guiding certain aspects of immune system development that can impact uh, the types of immune responses that, that we make when we uh, encounter a pathogen. So, uh, so one way in which the, the gut microbiota uh, um, impacts our ability to fight infection is by simply inhibiting colonization by pathogens. And you see this most prominently um, <clears throat> in uh, intestinal pathogens. And I've already given you one example of this, which is uh, Clostridium difficile. Um, but another example is shown here. So this is, uh, these are, um, uh, this experiment involves an organism uh, called Salmonella typhimerium, which is um, a, uh, a, a uh, gut pathogen, um, which can cause gastrointestinal disease. And so this, is, this uh, piece of data is from Wolf Dietrich Hart's lab and, in Zurich. And what these researchers have done is to colonize, use Salmonella um, typhimerium to challenge mice that are either conventional, so they uh, contain a normal microbiota, or they're antibiotic treated, uh, or um, they, uh, they may have, in this case, uh, Shadler flora, which is a simplified uh, microbiota. Um, and finally, they looked at, at what happens in germ-free mice. And so what you can see is that in the conventionally raised mice, you have much lower uh, levels of salmonella uh, colonization in these mice. And each of these dots represents an individual mouse. Um, and this colonization resistance is, is, high, is much reduced in, in all of these other conditions. So you really need... Uh, a complex um, microbiota, a fully colonized gut, to resist uh, colonization by salmonella. Um, the gut microbiota, uh, as I said, can also confer cross-protective immunity to intestinal pathogens. And a good example of this is seen um, in the case of, of Toxoplasma gondii. So Toxoplasma gondii is a, uh, a single-celled eukaryotic parasite. It's kind of a nasty bug. It infects the gut. Um, and if it's left unchecked, it can disseminate to other organs in the body, including the liver and the brain, and cause um, very severe disease. And so it turns out, um, in work from Felix Yaravinsky's lab, uh, that germ-free mice are much less able to mount an immune response against Toxoplasma gondii as compared to mice that have a, a fully colonized gut. And so the mechanism of this was unraveled, and so um, it turns out that intestinal bacteria induce uh, certain immune cells, mainly dendritic cells, to produce a cytokine, uh, a, a, a cell signaling uh, molecule called uh, interleukin-12, which in turn induces other cells uh, to, in the immune system pr to produce interferon gamma, which in turn confers protection against Toxoplasma gondii. So if you don't have your intestinal bacteria to stimulate uh, um, this cascade, starting with dendritic cells, you won't be protected against Toxoplasma gondii. And this is true for the immune response to many other intestinal pathogens, including salmonella. Um, another way in which the microbiota um, 
influences the immune response to infection is by guiding how immune cells actually develop. So one of uh, the important immune cells um, that is present in the gut and in other tissues are T cells. So this is a critical component. Uh, these cells are critical components of the adaptive immune system. And so in work from uh, Dan Lippman's lab at New York University, it was discovered that uh, certain bacteria um, that are resident in the mouse intestine called segmented filamentous bacteria. And by the way, you have to get a look at the pictures uh, of these bacteria. Um, it may, I don't think this picture does it justice. These are very creepy looking bacteria. They bury their ends into the, the intestinal wall. They look like little Loch Ness monsters, but they're actually fairly benign. They don't invade the tissue. But what they do is they stimulate uh, T cells who have, that haven't seen uh, a previous infection to differentiate into a type of, of T cell called Th17 cells. These cells um, are specialized to secrete a cytokine called uh, interleukin-17, which can be very um, uh, predisposing to inflammation. On the other hand, uh, other bacteria in the gut, including Clostridia, and so this is work from Kenya Honda's group in Japan, um, can stimulate these same naive T cells to uh, differentiate into Treg cells. And Treg cells sort of have the opposite effect. They actually dampen inflammation. And so depending on what, you, what kinds of microorganisms you have in your microbiota, um, this can alter uh, the nature of the immune response once you do see an infection. In the case of Th17 cells, promoting inflammation, and in the case of Treg cells, suppressing inflammation. So we don't yet understand the molecular mechanisms by which uh, these bacteria um, induce these different developmental pathways, but this is being uh, unraveled and I think will be a, a really uh, fascinating area to follow. So uh, I've told you about um, these uh, vast communities of microorganisms that inhabit uh, the guts of mammals and have very important effects um, on uh, mammalian metabolism. Um, so these are, this is definitely a symbiotic relationship that we have with our gut microbiota. But at the same time, these are bacteria. And so they do have the potential to invade our tissues. So as long as they're confined to the gut lumen uh, and perform their beneficial functions, everything is fine. Um, but there is the, the uh, capacity to invade deeper tissues and cause disease. And this is actually a significant threat that is compounded by the fact that not only do you have trillions of bacteria uh, in the gut lumen, but the, the, surface, of the uh, surface area of the intestine is absolutely norm enormous. So this is a schematic uh, drawing of uh, the gut uh, surface, uh, it's the surface of a small intestine. And what you can see is that there's uh, a single layer of epithelial cells that lines the entire surface of the intestine. This is really all that's standing between you and 10 to 100 trillion bacteria. So this raises an important question, which I'm, I'm not going to talk about here. I'm going to address it in the, the second talk in this series um, about how we keep uh, our symbiotic bacteria at bay. How do we keep them confined to the gut lumen and prevent them from invading um, our tissues and causing disease? Um, so the major concepts uh, that I've uh, covered in this, uh, in this uh, first talk in the series include uh, the fact that there are uh, complex bacterial communities that inhabit most human body surfaces, including the intestine, and most uh, prominently in the intestine. Um, the second uh, important point is that the intestinal microbiota, um, one of its major functions is to enhance energy extraction from the diet, so you get more caloric benefit from your diet by having a microbiota. And this, uh, this uh, probably was what drove the evolution of these host microbial relationships in mammals and, and invertebrates in general. Um, the intestinal microbiota, as I've just told you, is very important for shaping the immune system and also for uh, determining how we respond to an infection. And so I think uh, the, the final point that I want to make is that uh, the future holds exciting opportunities to use our knowledge of the microbiota to uh, advance human health. Thank you.